All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Um, Anthony Rosenzweig, who is a cardiologist and physician scientist at the University of Michigan, where he also serves as the inaugural director of the Frankel Institute for Heart and Brain Health. His research primarily focuses on heart failure, exploring the protective mechanisms behind exercise on cardiovascular health, and how dysregulated pathways like inflammation and cellular metabolism contribute to diseases in both the heart and the brain. Uh, prior to joining the University of Michigan, Dr. Rosenzweig held significant leadership roles at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School, where he directed the Cardiovascular Research Center and served as the Chief of Cardiology. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosenzweig in our speaker today. Thanks so much, Ahmed, um, for the kind introduction and the opportunity to participate in what's been a spectacular uh, symposium, and, and what an honor to be part of this ongoing legacy of Daniel Goldstein. I guess I've only been here a couple of years, so I only overlapped a little bit, but he was incredibly welcoming and gracious when I came. I certainly know him as an outstanding scientist, but also a, a, a wonderful person, so it's a real honor to participate in this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, age-related heart failure and why we think some of the driving mechanisms um, have relevance beyond uh, just aging. Um, and so these are my disclosures. Uh, most of them are not particularly relevant, but my former employer uh, has patented, along with Novartis, use of some of these active inhibitors uh, in heart failure. Um, and I've consulted for some companies where I've really been trying to push them to do clinical trials, which I'll... I'll, I'll uh, share with you is finally coming to fruition. Um, so a little bit of clinical uh, context. Um, everyone here knows that we've made enormous progress in the management, prevention, and, and, and treatment of cardiovascular disease. This is a uh, figure from an editorial that Betsy Nabel and, and uh, Jean Brownwell wrote for the Bicentennial of the New England Journal of Medicine, just pointing out that the death rate from cardiovascular disease has dropped dramatically over the past five or six decades. Um, and yet the burden of cardiovascular disease reflected in this one metric, uh, cost uh, continues to rise and is projected to be, at this stage, uh, more than $800 billion total in the United States alone by 2030. Those numbers have been updated to even a more staggering number. So how do we understand this paradox? And I, I think there are really three principal drivers. For first, in some sense, is the burden of our success. We've gotten good at getting people through their acute cardiovascular illnesses. If you come into the hospital now with an acute myocardial infarction, you know, the 30-day mortality is on the order of 3% as opposed to 1970, 1980 when it was 33%. Um, that's pretty dramatic. Um, but those patients go on and are at risk for the late sequelae of cardiovascular disease, principally heart failure and arrhythmia. Um, and then everyone here knows we're in an epidemic of metabolic disease in the United States and around much of the world. I'm not going to spend a lot of talk, uh, time talking about this, but I think it's an important driver. And then the topic of this symposium, obviously, is aging, and populations in the United States and around the world are rapidly aging. Our pet hypothesis is that the two of these things, metabolic stress and chronologic aging, conspire in what uh, Edith Feldman and I have started calling uh, MESA, metabolic stress and aging, to drive biological aging in a way that promotes both uh, heart and brain disease. Um, um, and I'll elaborate a little bit more on that. Just a little bit of the numbers, but I, I, I know this is familiar territory to everyone here, just showing really strikingly how the, the demographic in the United States that's actually most rapidly increasing is the population over the age of 65. Um, the population that I'm most excited about, have, being a relatively new grandparent, is under five, and that is actually dropping in the United States. And as you all know, the prevalence of cardiovascular disease rises as the population ages. Um, this is the prevalence in the over 80 group. Now, a lot of this is driven by the new SPRINT definition of hypertension, but applies to other cardiovascular diseases as well. So in some ways, this is obvious. When I'm in a clinical service and you ask fellows, like, what are the risk factors? Why does this person have cardiovascular disease? Usually they don't even mention age because that's kind of taken for granted. But if you think about it, it's not entirely obvious why aging is associated with cardiovascular disease. I mean, one possible uh, hypothesis is just the exposure time. The longer you live, the more time there is for insults and injuries to accumulate, ultimately living, leading to these cardiovascular disease. I think the more interesting hypothesis is that there are mechanisms intrinsic, intrinsic to the aging process that also predispose to cardiovascular disease. And I'm gonna spend most of the time talking today about something we 
heard uh, really elegantly introduced by Eliza, um, senescence uh, factors in this context. But as you think about it, as I thought about it, I mean, part of the conundrum is we have such little understanding of what aging really is. So, you know, there were two famous papers, 2013 and 2023, published on the hallmarks of aging. And what I noticed is that when you go from 2013 to 2023, they only get much more complicated. It's like more Ptolemaic loops into these orbits, um, showing how little we have a really coherent uh, conceptual framework for understanding what aging biology is or what the hierarchy of all of these different hallmarks might be. Um, some obvious mysteries in this context. If you look at mammalian species, the range in lifespan in mammals alone is two orders of magnitude. You know, if you look at a, a mouse versus a whale or some of the others, it's from two years to 200 years. And obviously we all have the observation that individuals we know seem to age at different rates. These are two men that are each uh, 60. Maybe this is a little bit of uh, foreshadowing just to say that uh, I'll, we'll talk about exercise. Um, I am not uh, recommending anabolic steroids, I would just say, but this person may have um, um, uh, indulged in a little bit. And then, you know, a famous observation is that presidents age rapidly in office. So something about the stress of that office um, leads to rapid aging. Since we're a purple state, I figured I'd represent both uh, parties here. So um, we know that stress of a variety of forms can make biological aging accelerate and worse. Of course, the more interesting question the older I get, um, is can we do anything that mitigates biological aging? I mean, these are some of the processes that, um, that exacerbate and are listed as hallmarks of aging. And obviously, this has been something people have been interested in for hundreds and hundreds of years, from Ponce de Leon um, on down. Um, this is a recent uh, article about Brian Johnson, who uh, used to be my, one of my kids' bosses in a startup company, made bazillions of dollars, and now spends those bazillions of dollars trying not to age. Um, and his hypothesis is that death is optional. Um, we'll see how that goes. Um, I may not be around to see how that goes. Interestingly, part of that, based a little bit on some famous parabiosis experiments, is that he has a son who he takes transfusions from, <laughs> and then he gives transfusions to his 70-something-year-old dad. I think the son is getting the short end of this stick. I mean, it seems a little bit unfair. He needs to have more kids or, or something. Anyway, um, he takes about $2 million worth of supplements as well. None of this proven, all with an N of 1. I'm certainly not recommending any of that. As you know, there's a more serious scientific effort to identify drugs. Largely um, here, Rich Miller's uh, efforts as, as, as the head of the Paul Glenn uh, Aging uh, Center have looked at a number of interventions that have identified both genetic and pharmacologic agents that um, really do seem to slow aging trajectories, which is really interesting. One of the most robust is rapamycin, and this was a recent New York Times article talking about how there are people out there taking rapamycin off-label with this indication. Um, you know, obviously it's not the only one, and there are some ongoing uh, clinical trials, for example, including metformin, and it'll be interesting to see how those things uh, play out. At the moment, I would say there's no proven uh, evidence that these things in humans really have the effects that they have had in, in some animal models. Um, so unfortunately, the bad news is there's no magic pill that you can take. I do think the best thing we have close to a magic pill is exercise. So there's a robust literature I don't have time to go into that exercise essentially counteracts almost every one of these hallmarks of aging. Um, of course, you know, I'm not the first person to think of this. The benefits of exercise have been long recognized. My former institution was very proud that Paul Dudley White had founded the cardiac unit there in 1916. And he, way before we had any data supporting this, was a, a vehement proponent of exercise. He has a bike path named after him. Um, in Boston Common. Um, so, you know, people have been talking about this uh, for uh, centuries or, or longer, but um, not everyone agrees. So, for example, um, Donald Trump has been quoted as saying the human body is like a battery with a finite amount of energy, which exercise only depletes. Um, so uh, we decided, you know, being scientists, we should test this hypothesis. And so we subjected mice in an age-related model of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction to exercise. And interestingly, and again, this was published long ago, you know, exercise actually reverses many phenotypes associated with aging uh, and uh, cardiac uh, function and HEFPATH. 
but not all. So for example, fibrosis is not reversed by this. This was in very old mice, uh, two, two groups uh, in the kind of two to 27, two years to 27 months uh, old. Um, we saw no evidence for the battery hypothesis. I just want to be clear that um, exercise only seemed to do good things. And then when we looked by RNA sequencing at the pathways involved, and we'll come back to this, one of the interesting things was um, the top pathway that was pushed in one direction by aging and in the opposite direction by exercise was a cell cycle progression. Um, uh, pathway, and I'll come back a little, a little bit to this. So, so we've been interested over the years, as I've been um, alluded to, in understanding what is the basis for the benefits of exercise. I've got to say, my mother would used to say, "Well, how much money did you spend to figure out exercise is good for you? Didn't I tell you that when you were a kid?" But of course, you know, the hope is to identify pathways that we might be able to tweak in patients who are perhaps not capable of exercise. So, we've looked at a range of different models and have compared um, sedentary mice who are just floating around to mice that are swimming. Um, we started with the swimming model, I've got to say, because I think um, I initially thought we'd have to have a really intense and forced form of exercise to see these benefits. It turns out that's not true. And this model has been criticized because it's stressful for the mice. And if you don't have a good lifeguard, the swimming model turns into a drowning model, which is a different question, interesting in its own right, but separate. So I've got to say more and more we use voluntary wheel running. Mice are not natural swimmers, but they are natural runners. And so if you give them wheels, they will generally run five to seven kilometers a night, um, which is pretty impressive given how small they are. Um, also, I find a little depressing because that's about what I run, and I'm pretty sure they're quicker than I am just looking at them. Anyway, so just to summarize a lot of postdoctoral lives and efforts um, to sort of three salient messages that I took away from these sort of a dozen years of studies in this. The first is that, which was surprising to me, I thought we would find a common set of growth pathways in both physiologic and pathologic models like the aortic constriction model that's already been uh, described by Matthias. Um, and the exercise models, and then certain things that were unique. In fact, there's almost nothing in common. There's almost no overlap between these. There are a few genes, you know, or proteins. We, again, we've looked at coding, non-coding genes, proteins, post-translational modifications, and so on. Um, there are some in common, almost always. There are some exceptions, but almost always when you find things that statistically change in both models, they change in opposite directions. Arguing these are really fundamentally different processes, and this is even when you look really early, like a week or two into these models. So the hearts look identical, and yet they've already started marching down very different pathways. Um, the second thing is that, and I'll come back to this I mentioned already, active, we consistently saw that exercise activates pathways associated with cell cycle progression. Um, I've got to say the first five times since I am not a stem cell person that I saw this, we ignored it, and then the next five times I said, well, it's probably just endothelial, proliferation, because we know it's an angiogenic um, stimulus, and then eventually I couldn't ignore it anymore, and I'll show you some of the data. It turns out it does increase cardiomyocyte proliferation. And then the last thing which has kept us interesting, interested in this is that pathways functionally important in exercise, without exception that I'm aware of, protect against pathologic stress, suggesting in composite that you find different candidates and that those candidates are highly enriched for potential therapeutic targets, so it's interesting. So just a little bit of the data, again, published a while back, collaboration with Rich Lee, who set up <clears throat> a really elegant system for using stable isotopes to really document cardiomyocyte proliferation, which it turns out is harder than one might think to do, and exercising young animals for two months with voluntary wheel running increases the birth of new cardiomyocytes by almost fivefold over those two months. It does a similar thing in old mice where the background rate of proliferation is almost zero. But it, just to say in absolute numbers, it kind of restores that back to the level you see in young mice. It doesn't go beyond that. And then just to point out the obvious, part of the reason the relative increase is so big is because the baseline rate of cardiomyogenesis, birth of new cardiomyocytes, is very low in an adult heart. But it's kind of remarkable that it can do it. How much does this matter? You know, I think Rich did some interesting calculations suggesting that if you do even increase the basal rate in mice and humans, is pretty well documented to be about 1% per year. If you increase that a few fold, and again, we're increasing it about five fold in these mice with exercise, um, it changes the average age of the cardiomyocytes in the heart by the time that individual grows up, at least, you know, by the calculus, just because of compound interest, right? So if, you, if you're if you increasing this rate now at 3% a year rather than 1% a year, by the time an individual human gets to be 50 years old, about 80% of those cells are younger than the individual, which is how in the science paper they documented 
um, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that there is cardiomyogenesis. The other thing, so there are younger cells, and if there is also a balance between uh, homeostatically between birth and loss of cardiomyocytes, um, uh, this is on the order that that could have an impact, but, but it's hard to find a way to really cleanly test that. Um, but it's an interesting concept. And then, um, you know, I think in a practical sense, as a clinician, the idea that these pathways linked to exercise are enriched for things that protect against pathologic stress suggests this is a good place to look for therapeutic targets. And then the question becomes, which of these are practical targets that you can actually uh, intervene on, and so we have a several that we're really interested in in this context, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to talk today about these SAS proteins, which we've heard a little bit about, uh, kindly already introduced, and the kind that I'm going to talk about are, um, I think of broadly as uh, ligands for the activin receptors, and so this includes um, activins themselves, which are dimers or heterodimers that are formed, so activin A and B and some other less common forms, um, myostatin, GDF11, which Rich Lee has been quite interested in, and these are major regulators of skeletal muscle growth. So they're linked to exercise in that one of the ways your muscles grow when you exercise is either through inhibiting these pathways or decreasing their expression, so that relieves that inhibition of muscle growth. And, and they can they can grow. And so there are naturally occurring mutations in almost all mammalian species. These are Belgian blue cattle. Um, Sage and Lee um, first cloned uh, myostatin when he was at Hopkins and made the knockout mice. There are mutations in humans that occur. Um, the key point I want to point out, though, is that Jason Rowe, who picked this project up when we were at Beth Israel Deaconess from Pablo Quintero, um, he made the really interesting observation that one of the challenges in thinking about, and I think one of the reasons there's been controversy about this pathway, is there are probably about 15 different ligands. There are also endogenous inhibitors. There are multiple promiscuous receptors. So it's really hard to figure out the stoichiometry of how these things are affecting the biology and just add it up like a simple uh, math equation. Um, but all of the ligands through the type 2 receptors induce expression of what is a natural inhibitor folostatin-like 3 shown here, and that's secreted and released into the circulation. It does inhibit the ligands, but it doesn't get them back down to normal. So in other words, when you see increases in folostatin, it means that this pathway is activated, and it probably is lower than it would be if there were no folostatin-like 3 or folostatin, but on the other hand, um, it can be used as a biomarker for activity. So with that as a, a prelude, some years ago in collaboration with Rob Gersten at, at Beth Israel Deaconess, we looked in the Framingham um, uh, general population for things that correlated with aging of the population. And folostatin-like 3 was one of the strongest correlates of aging across the age range in, in this population. The only one of the ligands, this is using a targeted proteomic approach, the only one of the ligands that positively correlated that was activin itself. And then we looked, there's not a lot of heart failure in the Framingham population, so we looked in an aortic stenosis population where we also saw that folostatin-like 3 and activin go both correlated with age in this population, which tends to be older, um, but also correlated with the severity of heart failure. So whether measured clinically by New York Heart Association or by NTBNP, a biomarker of heart failure, um, these correlated with heart failure. And we thought this was interesting partly because there were multiple companies for other indications that have been working on inhibitors of this pathway every, at every step of the way, and more recently, at least two that have been FDA approved, and one we use pretty commonly for pulmonary hypertension, uh, cetatercept. So if, if there's really something functional going on, there could be ways to intervene. And so Jason did a series of experiments, again published, so I, I'll kind of race through them a little bit, to ask whether activin could cause heart failure. And sure enough, you could create a mouse in which you're overexpressing activin. It le that is sufficient, even in a young, healthy mouse, to lead to cardiac dysfunction and heart failure. The cardiomyocytes are, are myopathic and have abnormalities of calcium handling and uh, contraction shown here. That's the normal, and this is the myopathic one. Of course, the, um, uh, the more interesting question is what happens if you inhibit it. So it's sufficient to cause heart failure, but it's also necessary in at least multiple models of animal heart failure for heart failure. So in that aortic constriction model that we heard about, in a genetic model of dilated cardiomyopathy developed by the Seidman lab where I trained, and in this age-related model of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, inhibiting this pathway, which we've done multiple ways with ligand traps, antibodies to the receptor, or genetically by knocking out out the um, 
uh, receptors in cardiomyocytes leads to pretty substantial benefits. We do a lot of these models, and I've got to say, we don't see a lot of things that take established heart failure and reverse it. Certainly not as close to normal as this comes. So that was kind of interesting. And again, models, drugs that are available in the clinic uh, today. Interested in the mechanism, the mechanism we initially identified, which we still believe, is that uh, active and regulates protein stability for circuit 2A, which is a key calcium handling protein. But um, Anand Singh, who is here uh, today, you know, kindly now with lineage um, uh, knockouts, double knockouts of of both type 2A and 2B receptors in cardiomyocytes and inhibitors has shown, uh, at least preliminarily, that the double knockouts are protected, but not as well protected as the systemic knockouts. So we think there are other lineages involved. And when we look at the hearts, the major difference is a reduction in inflammatory cells, principally neutrophils and LY6 high monocytes uh, in the heart failure model. So now, um, Anand, um, and now taking, being taken over by Yang Zhang, are looking at double knockouts in the myeloid uh, lineage. So we think in addition to regulating heart function, it regulates these systemic inflammatory signals, and that's consistent with evidence that Chao Wu, another postdoc in the lab, has accumulated by interrogating the UK Biobank. Follisatin-like 3 is on their, thank you, Bruce, um, is on their uh, O-Link platform, and it's associated, yes, with heart failure and coronary disease, but also with vascular dementia and other inflammatory disorders. And when we look at the pathways involved, um, follisatin-like 3 is uh, associated with senescence, but also other inflammatory pathways. Um, the embarrassing thing, and I'll, I'll kind of race through this, is that when we first found these, we really weren't even aware that they were SAS proteins. Um, and now, as you heard, you know, we, we understand that they fall into this much larger pathway. Um, it turns out that exercise inhibits SAS proteins more generally, and this is work that um, is posted but not yet published by Sumit uh, Ketterpal, who's been working with me and Bruce Spiegelman, showing that in a PGC-1 dependent way, exercise inhibits SAS expression. And then what he found is if you exercise PGC-1 dependent uh, 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 cardiomyocyte knockout mice, you develop an inflammatory cardiomyopathy that is due to increase in GDF-15, and he can rescue that by inhibiting GDF-15. So now that we became interested in SAS, you see it everywhere that you just initially didn't appreciate it. So just very quickly, um, we looked in COVID patients who have cardiac involvement, who were age matched to COVID patients who did not have cardiac involvement. The single most upregulated protein that correlated with this was falstatin like three. Of course, which is this chicken or egg? But the interesting thing is um, in, with Dan Baruch's laboratory who had infected Syrian hamsters with SARS-CoV-2, just infecting those hamsters with the virus induces SASP expression. So young, healthy animals infected express upregulated all of these SASP genes. So again, consistent with the idea that stress can induce a kind of biological hallmarks of aging. And then the last example I was going to give is this peripartum cardiomyopathy example. Many people here know an idiopathic type of heart failure occurs in late pregnancy or early postpartum, thought to be on a, on a on continuum with preeclampsia. So Jason and Claire Castro looked in patients with uh, preeclampsia or peripartum cardiomyopathy. And Quite shockingly to us, the single most upregulated pathway were SASP proteins. So why do these young women, 32 years old, have, on average, have this upregulation of senescence proteins? And then we thought, well, the placenta is born to die in 10 months. And when we looked at the placentas from patients with preeclampsia, that's where the 28 genes in common between these signatures were being expressed and secreted as proteins. Um, and the most upregulated one was activin. The second most hyperregulated was falsetin like three, and with those with sharp eyes, we'll see pi one, another downstream target, was also upregulated. Um, levels of activin and falsetin like three once again correlate with the degree of cardiac dysfunction. And then in an animal model of peripartum cardiomyopathy that was developed by Zoltarani some years ago, um, either a senolytic, facetin in this case, or antibodies to the active in receptor are able to not just prevent but restore cardiac dysfunction um, in this heart failure model. So what I find interesting about this is the model is that the placenta, a different organ, is secreting these senescence factors that are adversely affecting the heart. And consistent with this, there was a beautiful nature paper at the end of 2023 pointing out that organs age at different rates and they used a machine learning trade, trained um, approach to plasma proteomics, the same soma scans that I've been describing to you, where they were able to come up with organ-specific ages 
and organ-specific ages if they exceeded the age of the individual predicted disease. So if you had an age gap, they called it in your heart, you had about a two and a half fold increased risk of heart failure. If you had it in your brain, you had an increased risk of dementia. So this notion that there are different organ aging trajectories and that they can speak to each other and aging in one organ can affect another organ, you know, I think is fascinating. Um, I just say that we have now looked more systematically at a bunch of heart failure models. Um, so these are the metabolic stress hef HEFPATH models, but also an aortic constriction model. All of these induce senescence in the hearts. This is a gene set enrichment analysis. Interestingly, we also do the debanding model. Um, and in that context, once you deband, you remove the constriction, the senescence goes away completely. Eva Feldman has looked in the brain, and we'd see a similar uh, process of senescence in the brain, just to say that even I, along with Greg Lewis at MGH, have a new grant, and we're going to do a clinical trial of these active inhibitors in a HEFPEF population. So just to summarize and end, aging, of course, is one of the strongest risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Chronological aging is inexorable. We can't do anything about it. But I think what's so interesting is that biological aging varies across species, across individuals, and even within organs in the same individual. And so there may be an opportunity to think about these age-related signals as potential targets and biomarkers. And we talked about active and GF. 15 or senescence more broadly. I'm a little concerned about that because, I mean, Scott and I were talking about there are, in some situations, evidence where you inhibit senescence and it actually makes things worse, um, and exercise is a potentially valuable discovery platform. So I am exceeding time, which I apologize for. Happy to answer any questions. Uh, Tony, that was great. Uh, do you have uh, a sense of where the primary source of these uh, ligands are in age-related heart failure? I mean, you mentioned in peripartum cardiomyopathy. Yeah. It's mostly the placenta. And then related to that, what regulates the biosynthesis, exocytosis, and then also the degradation of these things in circulation? In yeah, no, great, all, all great questions. So, so one of the challenges is they're pretty ubiquitously expressed, and the receptors are pretty ubiquitously expressed. And I think in the Framingham data and in mouse data that I didn't show, the systemic levels go up, and they're coming from lots of places. When you induce heart failure, even in a young mouse, then the heart expression goes up, and there, you know, things are expressed there. And again, by single cell data, expressed in multiple lineages. They're all, they all have complex regulations, so they're regulated at every one of those levels. So transcription, translation, post-translational processing, they're mostly cleaved pro-proteins pro that are cleaved and then some of them for dimers, which also affect things, and then there are circulating inhibitors. So that's part of the complexity and why this kind of biomarker, falsat like 3 is potentially so useful because it's impossible, at least for me, to add up all of the contributions and know what the state is. But when you see falsat like 3 so far for us has been a very reliable marker. And in animals, when we can get the tissue, it correlates with SMAD phosphorylation and translocation, the, the real hallmarks of signaling. Uh, wonderful talk. Um, in all of that work that you presented, which is uh, marvelous, do you have a sense of, is there an aspect that is good senescence in cardiovascular disease? Um, great question. So I, 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 my own personal sense is that senescence is a very big grab bag that includes multiple mediators and phenotypes. So we've also used the SenMayo you know, thing, but we also have our own curated list. And if you look at the literature, there's hundreds of these things. And I think each of those stories needs to be investigated. So um, more directly to your question, you know, there was this circulation paper in 2022 pointing out that pulmonary hypertension is associated with senescence, increased senescence, but then in, in patients, but then in animal models, they intervened in a couple of different ways and removed senescent cells and it made the pulmonary hypertension worse. So there's a, you know, a, 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 one of the better documented examples that I'm aware of that senescence in that setting seems to be doing something beneficial. I think there's even more subtlety because it's not just senescence good or bad or you know, adaptive or maladaptive, it's, it's which mediators. So that's kind of why we're interested in not just using facetin but saying, okay, activin seems to be the big player in at least some of these conditions. We have specific ways we can in inhibit that. Um, and then we did publish in, in, in Diabetes a paper looking at um, a fatty liver disease where it turns out that there are also changes in these pathways. And I honestly thought we would overexpress activin and make things worse, and it actually made things dramatically better. 
So that's another example where at least one of these senescence factors, and so there's a lot of literature saying in fatty liver disease, senescence must be the problem, and maybe some of those factors are, but at least in our hands, when we active in which goes down in the liver, when we restore expression of that, actually makes it much better. I think a lot of that is energy homeostasis because these factors regulate you know, catabolic anabolic switches, and, and so pretty much anything that makes you lose weight in fatty liver disease or many obesity-related diseases will have benefits, so it's complicated. But yeah, I think there are some settings where it's good and it's been well documented. Yeah, thanks a lot, great question. Uh, just a, a tour de force, as always. Um, question is, uh, if these if active and then things that remain in the placenta are causative of senescence, why doesn't everything come crashing down when the placenta is removed? Like, shouldn't there be a precipitous drop? And then why does peripartum cardiomyopathy sometimes manifest only post uh, delivery. Yeah, um, they're great questions, and I don't know that I have great answers. We have some evidence that these factors last longer, and I think part of it, which Eliza had shown, is this idea that senescence begets more senescence. So I think once that cascade has started, just removing the placenta doesn't always immediately stop it. It's induced senescence in other tissues that are still continuing to secrete it. And then I do think there's a also there are sort of two components which I glossed over. One is the senescence factors, and in some people that seems to be expressed at a higher level, and we don't know why that gain is higher in those people. But then there's also the vulnerability. And so Zolt and the Seidmans had documented years ago that the people who develop peripartum cardiomyopathy have not a, a, a huge, but a, a significantly increased prevalence of these cardiomyopathy you know, mutations, including truncating mutations of Titan and so on. And, and so there's probably some combination of what are the levels of these senescence factors, which can have adverse cardiac effects, and how vulnerable are you based on genetic predisposition that determines those things. But it's a hand-waving argument. We don't really know. It's a great question. So sure. is there an evolutionary role, or why, why does polystatin go up with aging? Does it have a biological function or evolutionary role? Um, also a great question that I don't, I don't necessarily have a great answer to. I mean, I think as, as you know, I mean, most of the evolutionary pressure is on reproductive success. So I think aging then becomes a very different scenario, which is not subject to the same things. I do think in the context of heart failure, the initial increase in these factors is probably adaptive in the sense that they tend to induce a, um, an energy conservative state so rather than they take the organism from laying down more protein and building bigger cells and growing cells to a more conservative state, and, and even the inhibition of circuit 2A is part of that, and circuit 2A is a big consumer of ATP in the heart. On the other hand, like so many parts of heart failure, the, er, that early adaptive response becomes maladaptive. Those are not good long-term strategies. So I think, you know, like everything, dose and duration. So if you maintain high levels, for a long period of time, you'll eventually see the adverse sides of that. You know, there's probably an intermediate zone that you can get away with or may even continue to have some benefits, I guess, would be. Yeah. 